ten. Good afternoon and welcome to Deering Live. It is Wednesday, October 6th. It is 3.30 p.m. and I am standing in the woodroom at the Deering Banjo Company on what is a pretty dreary day here in sunny San Diego. It's not sunny at all, which is uh, too bad. But uh, we could not be more excited and honored to be here today to present and reveal the 2021 Steve Martin Banjo Prize winners to you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I first want to thank all of our longtime Deering Live viewers. You've been with us week in and week out for the last 18 months or so, and it's been so greatly appreciated. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Also, thank you to everybody who's new today. A lot of new viewers coming in. Um, this is what we do, like I say, week in, week out, different guests talking about the banjo, talking about technique and all those kinds of things. So we do hope you're able to join us uh, as we move forward after this episode. Thanks for joining us today. Now, you're probably reaching out to us today and, and watching via one of about seven different channels. This is the most we've ever um, put out on Deering Live and Deering Live's history, and we're very excited. So what I'd like to do just before we get started and into the proceedings um, is just give a quick thank you to all of our streaming uh, partners today. They are IBM A Water Bluegrass, Deering Live, of course, Freshgrass, Compass Records, Folk Alley, when it comes, No Depression, Studio Nine, and Artists at Work. Guys, thank you so much for all of your help in making this work today and for providing us your platform to stream through. Um, it's time to sit back for the next 20, 30 minutes or so, wherever you are in the world, grab a coffee, grab a tea. If you need something stronger, go for it. Now's the time uh, and enjoy the show. So why are we here? We're here to talk about the Steve Martin Banjo Prize 2021. Uh, like I say, we couldn't be more excited. And I think the cool thing today, whether we are banjo players or banjo makers, or we just love the music behind the instrument um, that these players create, you know, we're all here to celebrate, in this case, two winners. And the winners today, I think, and certainly everybody else seems to think, truly embody two very distinct banjo styles. And that's what's so cool about this, this prize and this award. So while the man couldn't be here, Mr. Steve Martin, I am going to turn it over to a pre-recorded video that he made just for this special occasion. So Mr. Steve Martin, please, the floor is yours. Hi, Steve Martin here on behalf of the Steve Martin Banjo Prize. First of all, I want to thank Fresh Grass and Compass Records for coming into the prize and helping it continue on for dozens and dozens of years. I deeply, deeply appreciate that. Now today, or tonight, wherever it is, we are going to announce the winners of this year's Banjo Prize. Our two winners represent the best of five-string bluegrass and four-string tenor banjo traditions. Both have made a remarkable contribution to the banjo's legacy through their mastery of the instrument, and both have generously shared their knowledge as dedicated educators. This year's winners are five-string bluegrass titan Alan Monday and four-string Creole jazz maestro Don Vappi. Congratulations to you both, and thank you for everything you do for the banjo. Now, over to Allison Brown to tell you more. All right, and here she is, as promised, the delightful Miss Allison Brown. Allison, how are you doing? I am doing great. It's great to be here on this wonderful location. I, likewise, it's wonderful to have you, and a uh, heartfelt thank you from myself to, to Gary and yourself and everybody over at Compass. Uh, uh, really, really great working with you on this project, so thank you uh, just ahead of time there. Um, there's probably a lot of people that know what the Steve Martin Banjo Prize is, but I'm sure there's some that don't. So you're on the board um, with a, an esteemed uh, collection of colleagues as well, but can you give us, uh, give us an idea? When did it start? What was the purpose? And talk us through kind of how it all works. You bet. Well, Steve launched the prize in 2010 and uh, with the idea of honoring the best in bluegrass and an old time banjo, which is essentially five string banjo traditions. Yeah. And over the course of a decade, he put about uh, half a million dollars into the banjo community. And 
honored some of the brightest stars on five string banjo, including Noam Pakilny, who was the first recipient, yeah. and Victor Furtado, who was the last recipient. And, and in between, Rhiannon Giddens won, and Jens Kruger, and Mark Johnson, Mark Johnson and a whole yeah. cast of wonderful banjo players. But when we got to the uh, decade point, it felt like there was it was time for the prize to evolve and, and kind of have a new iteration. So at that point, we decided to expand the vision of the prize to include four string banjo too, because you know really the roots of four string and five string banjo we we share a common ancestor. So it really made sense to bring it all under one roof and expand the board to have some different stakeholders across the banjo community, and uh, just really honor the breadth and the innovation across the spectrum of banjo styles that we're seeing today. So it's Absolutely. been really fantastic, and we're in year two of the new iteration of the prize. Right, and uh, B.B. Boness was on the list last year, I think, was it Jake Blount also? Uh, mm -hmm. Jerry O'Connor, fantastic four-string player, Irish player. So yep. yeah, it's, it's awesome to see it just kind of like spread its wings, you know, into those different areas of the banjo and really kind of encompass everything, you know, and I hope that continues, that's, that's really fun. Um, you're on the board. I mean, Baylor Fleck is on the board. There's a few other people as well. Is it, how does the voting work? Can you just give us a quick insight into that? Um, yeah, it's well, it's a pretty democratic process. Everybody on the board has the opportunity to, you know, throughout the year, um, amplify our database. We've got a really robust database of banjo players, and we try to keep it as current and as up to date as we can. So everybody weighs in with, you know, making sure that database is, is rich. And then yeah. it's a pretty straightforward process, you know, top five, your top five pick. Yeah. And, you know, really every year, the last two years, it's been a question of how many winners we're going to honor in a given year. And last year, because of the pandemic and the great need across the community, we really wanted to stretch the prize out among more people. And so we did five winners last year. This year, of course, we have the two winners. And deserved they are so. They are wonderful. I know that when we were on the call, David and myself with, with you and, and Gary and everybody, we were, we were so happy that Alan <laughs> and, uh, and Don have been chosen. We were talking about it right after. In fact, we were at Jens Kruger's house at the time and we were just talking about it. And it was awesome. It was really, really cool to hear. So I think uh, at this point, I mean, I remember when, when the awards were, you know, Steve would go on the Letterman show, right? That used mm -hmm. to be the thing. How do you think we're doing? Do you think we're, we're on par? Okay. I think that right. we're in lockstep with our times. Yeah, and you guys are doing a great job. We really appreciate your partnership on this. I, I honestly couldn't think of a more perfect place in 2021 to announce the winners. So thank you so much yeah. for being on board. You're so very welcome. We're moving into prime time. Speaking of prime time, <laughs> um, I think it's time that we met our first winner, don't you? Let's do it. All right. Alan Mundy is one of the true titans of the five-string banjo. A master of both three-finger Earl Scruggs style and melodic style banjo playing, Alan's musical vision has been pivotal in helping to push the instrument beyond the confines of traditional bluegrass. Alan launched his professional career in the late 1960s playing with bluegrass legend Jimmy Martin. In 1969, he teamed up with teenage Sam Bush, future Newgrass Revival founder, to record Poor Richard's highly influential instrumental album that foreshadowed coming innovations in acoustic-rooted instrumental music. He went on to join the Flying Burrito Brothers and later the Country Gazette, whose members included Byron Burline, a musical pal and classmate from his undergraduate days at the University of Oklahoma. Over the course of his career, Allen has amassed a discography of over two dozen albums including his classic solo project, Banjo Sandwich, which is a showpiece for his original compositions and impeccable technique. In the late 1980s, Alan joined the faculty at South Plains College in Leveland, Texas, as the bluegrass expert in the commercial music program. There, he perfected a unique teaching method for three-finger bluegrass banjo, which he continues to share with students at banjo camps around the U.S. and abroad. For his innovative work as both a performer and educator, we are delighted to honor Alan Mundy with this year's Steve Martin Banjo Prize. Congratulations, Alan. The Steve Martin Banjo Prize. There isn't a more deserving person than you. I'm so happy we met at the fiddle contest in Salisbury, Missouri, back around 1968, when you were playing guitar for Lou Berline and by the way, nobody's any better back on a fiddle on the guitar than you. But 
I already, you know, when I got to hear you for the first time, I was like hearing a person that your whole style was totally realized how you wanted to do this. And uh, the way you brought the fiddle melodies to the banjo, no one, no one can do that like you, Alan. And when you went with Jimmy Martin, I know you did it to learn more about the Crow and Scruggs Drive. And it was never more evident than years later on Down the Road by the Country Gazette, one of the greatest banjo kickoffs it's ever been. So I take great pride in the Sam and Allen record that we got to make years ago. And um, I just still marvel at your playing and your talent. Eddie Shelton would be really proud of you today. And uh, I just love you so much and thank you for let me be part of your professional life, Alan. So Len and I congratulate you and wish you the best. I love you. Three, two. Back. Oh, message from Sam Bush. That was amazing. And the montage was great too. Let's, uh, let's bring in David all the way from Louisiana. There he is. Hey, Dave, what's going on? I'm great. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Great to see you, my friend. And uh, let's bring in the man. Let's bring in Alan Mundy. Alan. <laughs> Huge hey, congratulations. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We're going to step out for a minute. Dave, you're going to take over. All right, Alan. Hey, congratulations. I, you, you're very, very well deserved. Um, well, thank you. You've been a big inspiration to me for, for a long, long time. I've, I've learned a lot from, from your various books and everything. Um, so how's it feel to be introduced by your, your, your friend, uh, Sam Bush? And, and what are some of your fondest memories of uh, working with Sam? Oh man, it's really good. Well, that was really sweet. Thank you, Sam. That was a surprise. I didn't know that was gonna be in there. What a, uh, uh, oh. You know, I met, as he said, I met Sam uh, probably 67, maybe 66. He said Salisbury, uh, Missouri, at a fiddle contest that I drove up there with uh, Byron Berline's dad, Lou Berline, and his brother, uh, Byron's brother, and uh, met Sam. I think he was 16 years old, and just immediately, uh, music made sense, you know. Uh, I had never played with anybody up till that point that was quite as advanced and uh, hip and just into everything. He could play all the Texas fiddle tunes. He could play, uh, you know, any contemporary uh, at that time. Uh, David Grisman was just a, sort of bubbling under and uh, we listened to everything we could. and played music as hard and as hot as we could for the few months that we had when we finally got together uh, to like, a, I was drafted, I got my draft notice uh, after I got out of college and uh, that actually is sort of the impetus for that Sam and Allen album was that we were, had been playing together, I'd live in Hopkinsville, Kentucky with Wayne and uh, I had to go to the army so we were going to make a tape uh, to do that. Uh, you know, just a remembrance of that, and that's what uh, Poor Richard's Almanac basically is, was this very low quality recording, you know, home, when I say home recording, I mean, uh, it could have been a wall and sack, I don't remember what it was, but just uh, whatever the technology was that people had in their homes at that time. Anyway, it was great, 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 and making that uh, album with Sam, uh, Sam and Alan together again for the first time. A wonderful experience. All the musicians. So it was a fine old time. Well, it's important to that to cap that you captured that time. That you know, uh, you, you captured that moment in time when you were playing with Sam before you before you had to head off the draft. Right. Um, how did you how did you get started playing with Jimmy Martin and what did you learn from that experience of playing with him? Well, uh, I didn't make it through the draft. They turned me down 4F. Uh, so I spent the summer working in Oklahoma, Norman, Oklahoma, which is where I'm from. And I 
rode to Nashville with uh, some friends of mine who were going to what was back then the DJ convention. And I was in contact with Wayne and Sam, and they said that Tut Taylor hosted, a, who was a dobro player, hosted a, a, a floor at the Noel, N-O-E-L, hotel in Nashville, and there was just a box of bluegrass picking. So we met up there, and there was a banjo player named Al Osteen, who I had met. Uh, Al was from South Carolina. He's uh, dead now. He died a few years ago. And he was playing with Jim and Jesse, and he said Jimmy Martin was looking for a banjo player, and he was coming up to the that floor of the hotel later on, and he'd introduced me, which Al did, and I sort of auditioned for Jimmy there, and uh, he told me if I wanted the job to be back and told him I was from Oklahoma, I have to go back and get my car and my stuff and move out. He said, well, be back here by next Wednesday and we'll go play. So <laughs> I, I joined him and was with him for a couple of years and uh, really learned a lot about, uh, Jimmy was kind of a prickly character and uh, there were a lot of things that you could learn from him that you shouldn't. But I, I was really, when he talked about the music and the banjo's role, so to speak, in the music, I listened very closely. And, you know, the banjo basically, for him, is a harmonic drummer. You know, he was very interested in the roles being very precise. He had uh, instructions on how to, you know, bring out the melody. Some notes were to be long, some short or quick. And so he would coach me in that. And, I wouldn't say I got it during the time I was with him, but over the course of my playing career, I would, I kind of came upon them and would go, oh, well, that's probably what he was talking about that whole time, that I, I wasn't able to do it. So, uh, uh, you know, he was had a lot, a lot of instruction on the banjo. He was on how it should operate and how do you get notes to stand out from the role and so a lot, a lot of good stuff like that. Everything about the music was very, very professional. And I really, really liked that, how he organized his sound. And he was very adamant about it. And it just was enlightening, you know, to how you have to play music to have sort of, for him anyway, this consistent presentation of how the music is to go that is called his. One time, just one quick little story. I played this on a slow song. We're doing a slow song. And I did this. Which is very much an Earl Scruggs thing. I didn't even get that far. He turned around and said, don't do that. And turned back around and went back to singing. And afterwards, he pointed out to me, he says, I'm not angry. He says, but that is Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs music. That is not Jimmy Martin music. And he says, I love Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs, but when you play with me, I don't want that. And sure enough, if you listen to his recordings, you'll never find a studio recording where the banjo player you know, does that very much Earl Scruggs thing. So there were a lot of those moments. Don't do that moments. You know, so uh, anyway, it was really... Uh, you know, a good, a disciplined, learning a disciplined way to play. And I enjoyed that. But, uh, right there is a great lesson, I mean, of him trying to teach you to be Alan Mundy, not to be Earl Scruggs, and to have your sound, not not to just copy somebody. Right, right. Well, it wasn't entirely that. He wanted me to <laughs> fit, in, fit into his mold of what yeah, yeah. he wanted. And uh, I can remember one time, in Kentucky, we played, I think, and I even remember the name, Crab Orchard, Kentucky. Anybody in Crab Orchard, Kentucky, uh, at a Jimmy Martin show, probably 1970. And uh, he was talking with somebody, and I was off to the side, and he said, oh, yeah, my banjo player. And Bill Keith, at that time, was sort of the new thing in banjo playing. And he says, oh, my banjo player can do that. And he says, come over here and play something like Bill Keith. So I think I played a little bit of sailor's hornpipe and jimmy said see he can do it but i don't want it <laughs> you know so he was 
you know, in a sense, what he was saying is my banjo player is a musician enough to do that, but he's also a musician enough to do what I want him to do. So uh, he was sort of that kind of character. Yeah. And uh, anyway, that was, was Jimmy. And, well, you've been a great educator for many years, be it through through going, you know, banjo camps or books, or when you taught at the, the college in Texas. Um, is there kind of a, is there something you see in intermediate banjo players that are struggling to get to that next level, a, a commonality that you often, you know, can, can give them a word of advice to kind of get them up to that next step? Well, you know, this is interesting. Uh, I was just speaking with somebody earlier. I said, you know, there's a million ways to play the banjo that sounds good, that makes good music, that people enjoy hearing, that you enjoy doing. That is not bluegrass banjo playing. So bluegrass has sort of these rails on it that you can't go outside of too very much and still be considered sort of bluegrass in a bluegrass band context. And so what I find is people don't really uh, study those people that made the style what it is. Uh, and I'm going to say Earl Scruggs. And we would say, well, everybody listens to Earl Scruggs, which is true. But you have to really get in there and study what they do. And uh, there's sort of two trains of thought going on. Uh, in banjo playing sometimes is people will say don't copy anybody have your own style and then they'll the other side will say uh, learn everything Earl did play it just like Earl and it sounds contradictory but what it is to me is that as a student of the banjo wanting to learn to play bluegrass in a bluegrass you know good traditional bluegrass context as a student you would absolutely want to listen to everything Earl did and try to copy it as best you could. And Alan Shelton and Sonny Osborne and Doug Dillard and, you know, just the whole uh, list of, of players from that school. And you get it down and it informs your playing. Uh, I think of playing, you know, if you were to try to play Foggy Mountain Breakdown exactly like Earl Scruggs, to me, I view it as taking a pilgrimage you're putting your fingers down in these and moving your fingers in what I consider this sort of historical way. And by doing that, you learn uh, things and ways of doing the music that you wouldn't learn without doing that, you know. And that's what pilgrimages are about. You know, you learn insights and things you wouldn't learn if you did not do that. Then, after you learn to do all that and you learn the vocabulary and you get the sense of the strategy of what's going on, then you step out and do your own thing, you know. And you do your own thing now informed by the playing of these other really great players. And music is such a collaboration. And I don't even mean in the moment when you're playing with other people, but it's a collaboration between yourself and everybody you've ever listened to, everybody you've ever gotten a lick from, uh, everybody that's given you advice. Uh, you know, it's just you're in collaboration with the whole, the, all the music of the banjo. Plus, you know, ultimately when you do move out and do your own thing, you collaborate with other musics from other genres and you know you just it's real cool so anyway back to your question is you have to learn all the ways that banjo playing was done before you get it down really good uh, pay attention to the tone and the timing uh, of it all and then take that and go forward with your own stuff at that point there. So that would be my something. Yeah, that's great advice. That's very, very, very good advice. Well, you've been, you know, a very big inspiration to me for many, many years. Uh, in the 90s, I remember 
wearing out that Festival Favorites album that you made. I was learning a lot of those tunes at the time. And, uh, and also that AccuTab transcriptions book uh, that you have. I, right. um, I know I l learned a lot from, from, from all of that. Um, and I know thousands of other banjo players have learned and been inspired by you through the years as well. Well, um, uh, hooray. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad, you know, I'm glad. That, yeah. That I played it, I'm glad that I played it in a way that people uh, found meaningful and inspirational or, uh, you know, they like derive joy from it. I always like to say, I'm always happy if I can play two notes in a row that people like. So, uh, <laughs> Well, do you want to play um, a, two mo a little more than two notes, but play some for yeah, us now? Yeah, I'll try. And you played it over the intro of my part anyway, so I'll play Peaches and Cream, which is a yeah. tune. Speaking of reaching out, it was inspired by the music of uh, Chet Atkins, Homer, and Jethro. And they had a series of albums called the Nashville String Band that they played just, in my mind, really beautiful tunes and luscious harmonies and things, nothing really, really hot, but just really good, solid stuff. And so I wanted to write something that was sort of in the, what I thought was in the spirit of that music. So I wrote this and I'll give it a try. Congratulations, you know, sincere congratulations from myself, from everybody. Um, well, very well deserved, and uh, I, you know, I'm honored to be, to be a part of this. To uh, to wish you congratulations on this board. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank Steve Martin and certainly all the board of the in the committee that made the selection. I was uh, when Allison told me uh, I actually had to pull off the side of the road, and I was so choked up when I called my wife, I couldn't hardly speak. And I said, I've got, I've got something to tell you. And I couldn't get it out. And finally I said, nobody died. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said, you know, I just, it, it was like, you know, you'd call up and talk about something terrible, but it was so wonderful. But I really was speechless. So thank you all so very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. And going, uh, Jamie, Jamie and Allison. We're here. We're definitely here. Oh, <laughs> like my heart was just, oh, that was amazing. Just to hear that, how you found yeah. out and calling your wife. That was beautiful. <laughs> uh, congratulations, Alan. That's uh, a wonderful story. Um, yeah, it, and it, uh, it was, I'm so excited for you, Alan, as I told you. And listening to you talk about, uh, to me, the way you articulate certain things on the banjo and then, that what you were saying about Jimmy Martin, it's really interesting to see how his influence kind of played through your playing. And, and a lot of that I really studied when I was learning. So um, it's it's amazing to see kind of the connection. But, you know, I've been an Uber fan since I was a teenager and had to get the same kind of Adidas sneakers I saw you in at a festival so I could be as much like Alan Mundy as possible. So right. Very good, very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Huge congratulations to you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Allison, what do you say? We, uh, that was a tough act. <laughs> that was really <laughs> nice. Um, what do you say we, uh, we, we meet and present our second winner today? I'm thrilled. Let's, let's go for it. All right. Four string banjo maestro, Creole cultural expert, and jazz man extraordinaire, 
Don Vappi is a living embodiment of 300 years of New Orleans music. Born into an extended family of musicians, Don began playing piano at six years old and trumpet in grade school before declaring a bass major in college. But in the late 1970s, he was introduced to the banjo and the sound immediately captivated him. Mentored by some of New Orleans' most well-known musicians, including banjoist Danny Barker and trumpeter Teddy Riley, Don quickly became one of the most sought-after banjo players in town. He began playing at Preservation Hall in the 1980s, and for the past quarter century has appeared regularly with Wynton Marcellus and the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. Steeped in Creole cultural traditions, Don's playing is informed by his desire to see the culture continue to thrive and evolve. As the leader of the Crescent City's premier jazz orchestra, the Creole Jazz Serenaders, Don is a regular at New Orleans Jazz Fest, and with his current band, Don Vappi and Jazz Creole, he performs regularly at festivals throughout Europe. He has presented educational programs for Carnegie Hall, NPR, and the Smithsonian Institution, recorded eight albums, and composed music for film and television, including HBO's Treme and American Creole, New Orleans Reunion, a PBS documentary which he co-produced and in which he is also featured. Congratulations, Don, on receiving the 2021 Steve Martin Banjo Prize. I want to congratulate my homeboy, Don Vappi, for winning the 2021 Steve Martin Banjo Prize. He is such a worthy honoree. I could list all the great things he's done, and he has a long list and is getting even greater. But I just want to say that he's a man of deep humility, a man of humanity, a man of intellect and study, and he's also extremely funny. He is soulful and he is the inheritor of the whole tradition of the whole Creole tradition, the New Orleans tradition, banjo playing, songs playing, guitar. But what you don't know about him is he is unbelievable funk bass player. And in the 1970s, I was always admiring of his Afro and those funky bass lines that he laid down for track one. I wanna say he's gonna go on to do many more great things because he is great. He's great from a human standpoint, as a musician, as a friend and as a person. So you could not have chosen a better honoree and I'm honored to speak about him. Words can't actually communicate the depth of what I feel for this man, the love and respect I have. Make him play something. Wow, that was, uh, that was beautiful. Dave, you're back, Louisiana. Let's bring him in. You can probably see him from there. You're muted, Dave. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Welcome, welcome. Well, Don. Congratulations, Don. I'm going to step Make out him... and let Dave take the floor. Make him play something, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, that was, that was, you know, how does it feel to be introduced by your friend, uh, Winton? And, and what are some things you've, you've learned from your time playing with Winton? Of... Uh, Man, I've, I, you know, I'm older than him, so I should be asking him what he learned from me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but Winton's cool, man. He's, you know, I, I do admire the fact that he embraced New Orleans music in an organization that was probably founded more in a modern jazz kind of thing. Because you got to think, New Orleans jazz is the foundation of everything. I think, I really believe that. All music in America comes out of New Orleans, man. That's just, and it's funny, Alan was saying something about the way Jimmy Martin told him to play in the band. It reminded me of a story I read about King Oliver when Lil Hardin, who was playing piano, was playing really in the high register of the piano. And, and Oliver told her, he says, look, Lil, you don't have to do that. We got a clarinet in the band. That was his way of saying exactly what Alan was talking about. Every instrument has a role to play. And the band leader is the person, he's like the painter. And all the musicians are like the different, it's like the palette, you know? It's, it was just beautiful, man. So much he said that's exactly, you know, that was well, great. Along, Thank you, Alan. Along, along that lines, uh, you know, what would you say is the role of the banjo in a New Orleans jazz band? Especially, you know, you, you're, you're, you're a fantastic bass player and guitarist as well, if people don't know. and. Uh, how would you compare it to 
a, you know, what a guitar does in a, in a jazz band? Uh, well, the thing about a banjo is it's a lot more percussive. So it's almost what Alan said, I mean, about the drum part of it. And in fact, we did a, uh, I did a song, I did a song that was included in one of the uh, NCIS New Orleans episodes and we were rehearsing it to be filmed. And the drummer asked me, he says, well, man, what should I be doing? I said, well, we're going to play it for you. So when I played it, he's like, man, I see why you don't need a drummer in the band. You playing, because <laughs> so I can be as rhythmic as the drummer, you know? So, but you have to find a place like to get even the guitar when when uh freddie green would play that you know that with basie it's kind of like a a little extra glue you know solidifying the rhythm section's pulse because it's also the harmonic uh harmonic uh palette as well as the rhythmic palette i mean it's, it's this pulse that just guitar just pulls it i think the banjo does the same thing but then, you know, in my life, I've known, everybody I've known pretty much hated banjos <laughs> because they were playing too loud. And I understand, because it can be loud, so you have to play with dynamics, you know? <laughs> I think that might be one reason people like me, because I didn't try to overplay. <laughs> oh, Is that man, partially why, why you play an open back banjo with a fiber skin head? To no, of... I actually, I like the open back sound. It It's different, you know? it's. It's a little darker, God, especially when I'm from the back of the band, it's even darker, you know, so, and I like that old sound of the calfskin heads, and I'm just not a big fan of the plastic heads, but at least not in what I'm doing, if, like, on a finger-picking stuff, it pops, man, I, I can dig that, but, you know, it's, everybody's got a preference, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you describe your music as, you know, as Creole jazz, you, you know, your band's the Creole Jazz Serenaders. What would you say, can you elaborate on what the influence of New Orleans Creole culture is on your music? I think, you know, when you talk about Creole music, you know, you can trace it right back to Haiti. And, and uh, it's sort of a, a great it's sort of like New Orleans in itself. It's a gumbo of, of all these different things. You know, you can you can have, you know, classical style music in it. And it's just, it was also very, uh, very rhythmic, very uh, syncopated. Like this, you know, as as uh, Sybil Kind, a friend of mine, he's, she's, she's gone, she's left us, but she used to say that syncopation is nothing new for Creoles, Creole music because we've got songs 300 years old that were syncopated. So it wasn't uh, Joplin that brought it in. <laughs> you know? so, but I mean, that, you know, it's, it's a real connection. Like people say, New Orleans is the most northern part of the Caribbean. And that's, I think that's true because the music is connected to the dance. That's a very strong African, uh, African concept that stayed within the music. And I think you could, you know, if you come to New Orleans and you see a band playing on the street somewhere, somebody's gonna be dancing to it. People that's from here, you know? Right. So. Um, what would you say to somebody if they're looking to play the banjo, they don't know what kind of banjo to play, you know, five string, four string, why would they pick up the tenor banjo? Well, um, well, I play it with a flat pick, and most of the time, the tenor banjo has this role of playing chords. You know? It's a different sound. It's just, it's just a different role that a tenor banjo would play in terms of a, a five string. You know, I was actually talking. I hope Tony doesn't get mad at me. I was talking to Tony Trishka, and he said he had this gig. And he's in the orchestra playing his part. And I don't know who, Stephen Sondheim or somebody famous like that goes, no, tell him I want that, I want him to play that role, you know, like Hello Dolly kind of stuff. And he's got a five string and he's like, oh no. <laughs> but I've been in that same situation 
where people want a finger picking kind of sound, you know, because it's, it's amazing how a lot of people don't know the differences or even the variety of banjos that are available and the styles. So, but if you want, if you play, honestly, if you play guitar, the five string is closer in tuning than, than the guitar tuning. But uh, if you're gonna play in like a, a New Orleans style jazz band, tenor is more, more common. And uh, I have this theory and I don't know if, if it's been proven or whatever, but I really believe tenor tuning the, in fifths, it's in fifths, like a cello or a viola. And I think that tuning is open enough to where it, it cuts through the horns. Because that's the thing about playing jazz down here. You got all these horn players. I mean, you got a trumpet, a clarinet, trombone, and the drums and all. I mean, the ban you know, banjo can get lost. Any instrument can get lost in that. A guitar, definitely. But, man, a five-string band, I mean, a four-string banjo tuned in fourths, you got this three-octave voicing here. It's just like if you get on a piano and voice it out like that. It's just a bigger sound. And I'm going to get kind of science on y'all, but, you know, that space allows for the harmonics of each note to add some, some uh, to fill in those spaces. So it does make for a bigger sound. So. Well, how's it feel to win the, the, the Steve Martin Banjo uh, Award? And, uh, and, and, and what's next for Don Vappi after this? Well, I thought it was a mistake, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I thought somebody made a mistake at first, but, um, I, well, what's, what's next for me is r fixing my roof after Hurricane Ida. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So it came in handy, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't know, go to Disney world. I don't know, man. I have, I have no idea what I'm going to do, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, like they say, you know, I'll just keep playing gigs till the money runs out. You know, <laughs> that's the jazz musician joke. So, well, Don, uh, I think you know you've been such an inspiration to me. I play the tenor banjo because of you. I remember when I was making the switch from uh, switch over to playing. I was like, well, what's 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 Don Vappi doing? And he, you know, is he playing plectrum or is he playing tenor? And then how's he tuning it? And uh, and uh, uh, you know huge inspiration for myself and, and, and many others as well. And thank you for being such a ambassador for the banjo and, and the four string banjo and New Orleans music in general. Um, and congratulations on, on everything, you know, on the award and everything you've done. Thank you. Well, very thank much. you. Thank you, man. That's, it's a real, I, I, I like I mentioned to Hillary, I, I was speechless, man. Thank you so much to be, uh, it's really feels good to to be noticed <laughs> you know? so you know yeah i hope my local community is proud man because i'm so proud of people like winton and terrence blanchard just did an opera and I, i'm like you know the community man it takes a village we're we're all in the same we're all going through the same stuff it just looks different but you know, I'm just proud of everybody. So thank, thank you for, for this, for this, for the honor well, of this, the instrument of the griot, who was the most powerful <laughs> man in African society. Yes, <laughs> I love it, man. Fantastic. You wanna play something for us now? Yeah, well, because Winton told you, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so actually I was trying to think of what to play. My wife always tells me what to play but she's not here. So um, I'm going to play a song that is actually from Haiti. It's called, it's called the onions uh, in French, les oignons. And uh, it's the jazz version of it. Les oignons, 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 Ma 
אדם, הוא כבר מותיר נו מדם. Congratulations very much, um, and, and thanks for all that you do, you know. Uh, oh, man, keep thank on, you. Keep on playing. And thank you. I'm honored to be a part of it. Congratulations to Alan as well. Um, Want to bring Jamie and, and Allison back in? We're here. We're still here. Don, congratulations. That was amazing. What, what a beautiful uh, performance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. It's thank Allison's you. fault, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I'm going to be coming down to sit on your porch and get some banjo lessons, though. And, and oh, you got to swap with me because I I'm getting the five string. <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about that before I we wanna, went live, right? You I want to about... figure it out, man. I want to figure okay. it out. All That's right. a deal. I'll be I'm coming down there. I just right. those those chord voicings are just kill me. They're so beautiful. Thank you for oh, sharing that. Well, thank you, thank you. That yeah, was a truly. Lot of fun. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate you both. Congratulations to Don and Alan. Um, Alison, any final words of wisdom before we head out? Oh, well, you know, I mean, I think that our winners just really exemplify the richness of the banjo community, uh, kind of the, the depth of the instrument and how, you know, how it has so many different places in American society. And to me, that's one of the really fascinating things about being a banjo player and i'm just so proud to be part of this community with everybody it's been fantastic yeah it really is and it's so good to see the steve martin banjo prize uh expand right like we said earlier on on, on the banjo world and the different styles and long may that continue and uh man i think the only thing left to say again is, is congratulations don uh and congratulations to alan two incredibly deserved winners um thank, thank you, you so much to everybody for joining us thank you allison thank you david Thank you, Don. Thank you, Alan. Everybody stay safe. And next week, Jake Sheps is on the show, so please feel free to tune in during live. Um, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Be safe. <laughs>